everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHOS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. We are going to be talking about the abysmal track record that the U.S. state has for lying to its people in order to get them to go along with its plans for war and ultimately for world domination uh, by force, by threats of coercion and actual implementation of coercion. So we are going to go back and review a little bit of the 20th and now the 21st century and some of the wars that were fought then. Do you remember when the uh, state was talking about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and then, you know, we couldn't find them. They're not under the counter. Where could they possibly be? Well, they weren't there. They were lying to people in order to get them to go along with war. And now we're seeing the same exact thing unfolding in Syria, where the government is saying we have to destroy ISIS or ISIL or whatever that name of the organization that wants to create a new state out there, which uh, conveniently started to pop up as soon as Iraq had been devastated and could no longer defend itself and actually wanted some revenge for all of the destruction that was wrought on it. Um, now we see that uh, Syria is actually the target. Do you remember a little while back when Assad was supposedly this terrible bad guy who was using chemical weapons on his own people and they had all this evidence and, well, that turned out to be a lie and they wanted to invade Syria at that point. They wanted to go and bomb and murder and kill and uh, go to war with Assad and that turned out to be complete lies, complete falsehood. And now they are bombing Syria over the ostensible reason of bombing ISIS. But that turns out to not really be the case either. So uh, here to talk a little bit more about that is uh, Steve MC. He runs a blog called undergroundreports.blogspot.fr. And uh, his article is called U.S. Does Not Want to Stop ISIL, Only Exploit Them for Other Means. Instead of deterring the radical Islamist group, American airstrikes against them have accomplished two things. They have increased ISIL recruitment while at the same time have destroyed and degraded Syria's infrastructure, murdering innocent Syrian civilians along the way. FBI Director James Comey told Congress in mid-September, just a week before airstrikes against ISIL expanded from Iraq and into Syria, that, quote, support for Islamic State increased after U.S. airstrikes began in Iraq. And, quote, ISIL's widespread use of social media and growing online support intensified following the commencement of U.S. airstrikes in Iraq. According to the UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, a large increase of 6,300 new fighters have been recruited into the group since the U.S. began airstrikes. This is not surprising given the fact that Islamic extremist groups like ISIL draw their greatest legitimacy among their constituency from either actually fighting or appearing to fight against the United States. A month ago, Patrick Cockburn, a leading correspondent on the Middle East, reported that, quote, the U.S.-led air attacks launched against Islamic State, also known as ISIS, on the 8th of August in Iraq and the 23rd of September in Syria have not worked. President Obama's plan to degrade and destroy the Islamic State has not even begun to achieve success. In both Syria and Iraq, ISIS is expanding its control rather than contracting. Despite not only failing to degrade ISIL, the U.S. airstrikes have also accomplished another long-standing U.S. goal in the region, the further destabilization of the Syrian state. It has accomplished this by bombing Syria's energy facilities and infrastructure under the pretext of choking off the revenues ISIL receives from its illicit oil sales. However, this justification completely falls apart upon closer examination. The U.S. has been bombing oil and gas production sites, including oil fields and refineries inside Syria, and following one such strike in late September, Reuters would, would report, quote, These so-called refineries are not a real target, and they do not weaken Islamic State, as they do not have any financial value for them, Rami Aldebron of the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights told Reuters. 
Quote, they are composed of trucks with equipment to separate diesel and petrol used by civilians. These attacks, instead of striking at ISIL's financial base, are accomplishing only the further destruction of Syrian infrastructure. Coupled with this fact that although there have been widespread airstrikes against oil production in Syria, there have, however, been exactly zero strikes against oil production facilities inside of Iraq. The U.S. is keeping intact energy facilities inside of the state that it has control over, whilst destroying the infrastructure of the Syrian state, which it seeks to degrade and destroy. This two-faced approach is a further attack upon the Syrian government, eliminating any chance they have of recapturing their nation's oil refineries intact, which would also subordinate Syria to foreign investment in the rebuilding process if they were ever to be recovered. Quote, the destruction of Syria's oil infrastructure would also open the door for U.S. and U.K. oil companies to win contracts to rebuild it, paid for in debt, by the Syrian state. Foreign companies running Syria's oil and gas production would prevent Syria from nationalizing their own resources and becoming an independent, prosperous country. This would result in the basic enslavement of the country while mitigating the threat it poses to U.S. client states including Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. Maram Suzli, a chemist who worked alongside Theodore Postel to debunk false claims of Assad's complicity in the Gauta chemical weapons attack, further analyzes. It should also be noted that this isn't just an attack on the Syrian government. It is also an attack on the Syrian people as fuel and oil prices have soared following the bombings, as well as have electrical failures and power blackouts. Quote, the Americans are destroying our infrastructure, one 35-year-old resident said. It should be stated that in the end, these oil resources ultimately belong to the Syrian people. Casting further doubt on the United States' stated aims is the fact that senior Obama administration officials are now considering bombing pipelines in Syria, quote, in an attempt to cut off the huge profits being made by ISIS from captured oil fields. However, ISIL does not use these pipelines to transport and sell its oil. Instead, it uses trucks and smuggles the oil through Turkey. Quote, current oil production by the Islamic State in the Levant is estimated to be worth $800 million per year. The oil that ISIL sells on the black market, mostly via trucks through smuggling routes on the Turkish border, is sold at a steep discount price, ranging from $25 to $60 per barrel. IHS, the consulting company widely quoted as an authority on ISIL oil revenues, reports. Thus, we see the seeds being planted for further justifications to attack and destroy Syria's energy industry with no valid connection to stopping ISIL. Along with the destruction of Syria's oil infrastructure, in September, the ambassador for the European Union in Iraq, Jana Hyboskova, testified before the European Parliament Foreign Affairs Committee stating that several EU member states have bought oil from the Islamic State while refusing to name the guilty parties. So, while the Western powers are profiting from ISIL's illicit oil trade, keeping intact the refineries and oil fields in Iraq presumably to do so, they are as well destroying Syria's infrastructure as a further way to destabilize the Syrian state. So again, this was the targeting of Syria all along. Remember, they, they already revealed to you their plan. They already told you that that is what they wanted to do, to destabilize Syria, to go after Assad, and they're just using ISIL as the back door to be able to do so. The article I just read there was uh, from the reports from Underground Blog. It's uh, undergroundreports.blogspot.fr, and the author is uh, Steve M.C., the next article I'd like to read is by Michael Rosef, and he's also upset about the lies that got us into the Syrian war, and more importantly, some of the destruction uh, to the people themselves in that area. He says, The Syrian war continues unabated. The number of Syrian refugees out of the country is huge, over 2.5 million. They are flowing into neighboring countries and enduring tough conditions. An estimated 4 million Syrians are displaced inside the country, and 6 million Syrians need help. The war dead in Syria number approximately 200,000. 
The neocons have supported the war to bring down Assad from the outset. They count the misery endured by Syrian refugees, which particularly affects children, as nothing. Nothing at all. They regularly call for greater American intervention into this war. In 2011 and 2012, they renewed their calls for the U.S. to intervene more deeply than it already has. U.S. allies in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states have been supporting the rebel groups materially. These groups are now dominated by Islamic fundamentalists. Obama proposes to resettle a small number of Syrian refugees in America. This is a token and supremely cynical ploy. It is no real solution to the problem. Obama fails to acknowledge the continuing and increasing American role in contributing to the refugee problems. He strongly called for Assad to go and supported the rebels. He has significantly augmented the U.S. support for rebels. He is already bombing Syria and Iraq. He has already augmented forces in Iraq. Plans for the reintroduction of boots on the ground are in the works. Like the neocons who do not recognize the hugely negative impact of their policies on people who live in these Middle Eastern countries, Obama is intent on bringing down Assad and weakening Iran, even though the wider unintended effects of this near four-year-old war may well work against the U.S. government and America. If Obama really cared about the Syrians, he would never have encouraged the rebellion, and he would not now be ramping up American military activity on its behalf. He knows full well the devastation wrought in civil wars. Obama doesn't care about the war's effects on Syrians any more than the neocons do, and they care not at all. Obama's compassionate words for disadvantaged and poor people are, I believe, really fake and feigned posturing for political and other ends of his. If he really cared about ordinary people, would he have encouraged the civil war and the war in Ukraine? Would he have launched sanctions against Russia that are surely harming ordinary Russians? He and his advisors full well know that these sanctions have broadly negative economic effects, just as sanctions against Iraq and Iran have had. And those sanctions in Iraq killed over 500,000 people, mostly poor women and children. Um, the next article I would like to read is some more lies that are coming out uh, about the Syria hero boy in the video that's uh, widely circulated in the social media. Perhaps you've seen it. It's a dramatic video clip about a, a young boy who's rescuing this uh, girl out of the gunfire in Syria. And um, this is uh, all propaganda that was uh, put out by the government in order to uh, convince people to go along with the war. So Daniel McAdams is going to talk a little bit about this, and the article is uh, Syria Hero Boy Video Revealed to Be Government Propaganda. A dramatic video clip showing a young boy heroically rescuing a young girl amid a hail of gunfire in Syria has racked up millions of YouTube viewings and has been trending heavily on other social media platforms. The mainstream media and U.S. government jumped on the video as evidence of the absolute depravity of the Assad regime. What kind of monster purposely targets children? Wrote the International Business Times, quote, The incident certainly is not the first time that pro-Assad gunmen have targeted children in the nearly four years of the bloody civil war in Syria. Liz Sly, the Washington Post bureau chief covering Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and presumably an expert in the area, promoted the video on her Twitter page, adding wow in her comments. Sly's reporting consistently agitates for more U.S. involvement in Syria on the side of the rebels. Her anti-Assad bias is solidly established. Then the experts chimed in. According to the London Daily Telegraph article since consigned to the memory hole, the experts have, quote, confirmed the authenticity of the video. Then the U.S. State Department chimed in to magnify and focus the propaganda, tweeting that a boy hero rescued a girl from Assad regime sniper firing on civilians. One problem, the whole thing was a fake. The Norwegian Film Institute, funded by the government of NATO member Norway, chipped in $30,000 for the film to be produced in Malta and released publicly without informing viewers that it was not authentic footage. 
The filmmakers made it clear to the Nor Norwegian government in their funding application that they would not reveal that the footage was fake and authorities raised no objection to the operation. The BBC wrote about how so many people were fooled by the film. Quote, so once the film was made, how did it go viral? It was posted to our YouTube account a few weeks ago, but the algorithm told us it was not going to trend, Klevberg said. So we deleted that and reposted it. The filmmakers say they added the word hero to the new headline and tried to send it out to people on Twitter to start, start a conversation. By the time its inauthenticity had been established, millions were outraged at the Assad government. Propaganda depends on framing the issue first. No one reads corrections once a false story is printed. How convenient this is at a time when so many NATO member countries and the usual interventionist suspects are pushing hard for the U.S. government to retool its Syria anti-ISIS campaign to first target the Assad government for destruction. This episode should demonstrate how easily it is for governments to hide behind willing accomplices and the social media to produce and disseminate propaganda. State Department spokesman Mary Harf recently drew some ridicule for stating that U.S. evidence, quote, proving Russian involvement in the sh shootdown of Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 over Ukraine came from social media sources. Perhaps those social media sources she urges us to rely upon are similarly supported and funded by governments with an agenda to push. They are lying to us. That article was by Daniel McAdams. You can read both of those articles online at lewrockwell.com. Now that we've discussed some of the more current events that are going on, I think we can go back in time and see a little bit of where this trend of lying to the public in order to get them to go along with war really comes from. Uh, this goes back as, as far as Polk uh, with the Mexican War that happened um, back in the early 1800s. He lied to the people about Mexico attacking the U.S., and then he whipped up a firestorm of people that had to go in and take over, and they went and uh, killed people in Mexico. But the problem was his story about Mexico invading us was false. Abraham Lincoln pulled the same exact trick when he got the South to fire the first shot by manipulating them into the war and then lied to the public, saying that he was not rearming the people in Fort Sumter, but he was merely sending them food and, you know, basic supplies, which was not the case. He was sending armaments. He was sending people and arms and guns and weapons to reinforce the fort, which the South explicitly requested that he not do. Uh, this goes into World War I as well, when the Lusitania was shot down by German U-boats, and uh, Wilson was outraged. He couldn't believe that the Lusitania had been shot down by the Germans when, in fact, the Germans knew, and the U.S. knew as well, that the Lusitania was also carrying arms and weapons and bombs that the Germans recognized were uh, arming the British. They were, they were going and trading uh, arms with the British, and so the Germans shot the ship down, but the U.S. went and lied to its population, saying that there was uh, just civilians. The Germans were just killing civilians. We had to strike back against them. And so when we fast forward to World War II, we see that the same exact thing uh, is occurring here. And here to talk about that is Bionic Mosquito. His uh, blog is bionicmosquito.blogspot.com. I have commented previously that I believe, at least given my current understanding, the main purpose for U.S. entry into World War II was twofold. One, to take the place of an increasingly ailing Britain as the primary tool for the elite to expand global control, and two, to ensure a new long-term enemy can be made out of the Soviet Union and communism. I will add a third to this list. Actually, it is a subset of the first. To bring the productive populations of Germany and Japan under the control of the elite. Before I expand on this further, I would like to revisit some of the factors regarding the war and why it is not just improper, but inconceivable to refer to this war as a good war. 1. Roosevelt lied to the country regarding his intentions of entering the war. 
too. Roosevelt took great strides to first get Germany and after failing this, Japan to strike the first blow. 3. Roosevelt ignored and otherwise did not take advantage of the many proposals by Japan that, if acted upon, could have avoided the upcoming armed conflict. 4. Roosevelt entered the war well before any declaration by Congress. 5. Roosevelt encouraged Britain and France to provide a guarantee to Poland, a guarantee known to the Western powers, to have no teeth. 6. Roosevelt chose to side with Stalin, who at the beginning of the war had more blood on his hands than all the other leaders of belligerent countries combined. 7. Roosevelt did not extend U.S. support for Jews attempting to emigrate from Central Europe and immigrate into the United States until 1944. 8. Roosevelt knew of the impending attack by Japan somewhere in the Pacific and very likely, specifically, that it would come at Pearl Harbor. 9. Roosevelt avoided taking action to properly alert and otherwise protect the troops. 10. Roosevelt made unconditional surrender a requirement of the Axis combatants, prolonging the war in both Europe and the Pacific. 11. Roosevelt cut Poland loose to the communists after the war. 12. Truman had many opportunities to end the war in the Pacific in the spring of 1945, instead choosing to delay the end in order to give time for development of the bomb. 13. Truman continued Roosevelt's policy of demanding unconditional surrender despite protests from many military and other advisors. 14. Truman chose to drop two bombs on Japan after months of Japan signaling its willingness to meet all terms of the Allies with the exception of the removal of their emperor, emperor, an exception also desired by Allied commanders and an exception granted immediately after the surrender in any case. 15. Truman afforded many diplomatic victories to Russia in Asia, despite the lack of contribution or need of the Russian forces in this victory. 16. Truman backed away from the Chinese nationalists in favor of the communists, this despite one purported reason for U.S. animosity toward Japan being U.S. support for the nationalists. 17. The Allies both acquiesced and aided in the forced transfer of up to 14 million Germans to Germany from various locations in Central Europe. 18. The Allies both acquiesced and aided in the forced transfer of perhaps several million captured Russian soldiers and other refugees fleeing the communists to Russia against their will, resulting in their imprisonment or execution upon return. Lies, deception, treachery, genocide, and potentially treason. Can anything associated with such actions be called good? Can a government be called representative if it acts with deception towards its citizens? Can a democracy or a, or a republic be considered acting based on the will of the people when such actions are taken via lies? Except for the fact of winning the war, can these actions be distinguished from many of the crimes on the side of the Axis, for which countless were tried, imprisoned, or executed? There is nothing good about this track record. Now, as to the purpose and reasons for the U.S. entry into the war, let me first summarize again the outcomes of the war. First, the United States replaced Britain as the global presence and power of the West. Second, the Soviet Union specifically, and communism generally, gained significant footing as a world power. Finally, the populations of Germany and Japan both came under the domination of Western elite power. Now, just because these were outcomes does not necessarily mean that these were objectives from the beginning, or that these were reasons for U.S. entry. However, I can find no other reasonable explanation for many of the actions taken by the U.S. in the period before, during, and after the war, many of which are identified in my list at the beginning of this post. I do not accept that these were just blunders or mistakes of Roosevelt and his advisors. They were far too experienced to make this many disastrous and wrong decisions. I do not accept that Hitler was prepared to take over the world and had to be stopped. He had neither the military for it, nor the economy. Mostly, he did not have the intent. Conversely, supporters of communism were quite transparent in describing their goals for world conquest, 
why not fight against the communists, as Germany and Japan both seemed intent on doing? When I try to find a rational explanation for these decisions and actions, and I follow the thread backwards from the outcome, the decisions make perfectly sense only if these outcomes were the objectives all along. First, I suggest that the U.S. entered the war in order to replace the ailing British Empire as the primary tool of the elite looking to expand global domination. For those who believe politicians serve their people and the national interest, and are not serving individuals and entities with even higher power, you may feel free to skip this section. For the rest of you, historically Britain proved to be a good tool for extending global control. However, a far better tool was on the Western horizon, that of the United States. The U.S. had almost unlimited potential in terms of geography, resources, and people, certainly as compared to Britain. The U.S. still had much to exploit, as it was becoming more and more obvious in the first years of the 20th century. Britain had likely reached its limits. Britain was losing on all fronts. It could not fight a war in Europe without U.S. support. It lost much of the Middle East shortly after the Second War, and it also lost India. These weaknesses, especially when compared to the obvious superiority of the U.S. as the primary tool for control, were certainly obvious to the elite well before the actual events. I should clarify: this transition did not occur in the immediate build-up and aftermath of World War II. The establishment of central banking in 1913 was the key to ensuring the United States would be in position to take over this role. Without this, there is little possibility that enough resources could have been taken from the private sector to the degree necessary for the establishment of a global military power. While imperialism was present in the U.S. from the beginning, overseas expansion began at the end of the 19th century. Even with this, much of the population had to be dragged into fighting a European war in the second decade of the 20th century. The people had no appetite for fighting overseas, yet Wilson found a way to maneuver the country into the battle. This desire to keep out of European troubles was still in the population in the 1930s. The people wanted to stay out all the time. Their president was secretly working to get in. If the objective was to avoid war, Roosevelt had countless opportunities to do so. If the objective was to get into the war despite the people and Congress that desired to stay out, Roosevelt's actions make perfect sense. Roosevelt served with purpose toward this end, clearly against the will of the people he purportedly served. Why would he do this? I suggest it was because he was serving a different master, a master who knew that riding the British horse was now turning into a loser's proposition. That horse had been ridden hard and had nothing left to give. A new horse needed to be found, and no other horse fit the bill better than the United States. The elite needed the U.S. to take center stage, and they found political leaders willing to lead the nation toward that end. So that article was by Bionic Mosquito. You can find it at bionicmosquito.blogspot.com. It is called World War II: The Good War. So I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Austrian Circle. We have been talking about politicians and war, and how the state generally lies to its population in order to get that population to go along. With its wars, and as we know from studying libertarian ideas and class structure through a libertarian lens, we know that war is the health of the state, or perhaps more accurately stated, the state is the health of war. So I hope that you enjoyed this. Have a great week. Take care.